we're talking about the future of Toronto and its development and looking at questions like what will activate a public space, how can we plan for a good engaging public life, and looking at things like the private and public divide. Um, we talk a lot about architecture, sometimes we talk about culture, sometimes we talk about um, transit, but to talk about the public realm or the place where sort of all of this comes together is a really important topic. Is the public space is a space we share in the city and there's a lot of competing interests of what should happen um, and it's not always coming from a place of us all wanting the best product at the end. And it's hopefully something people can take and start to think more about the many dimensions of designing the public realm that aren't only design related but have to do with how people connect with each other, with their city, with their environment, those kind of things. Examining our history and also the current state of our city and how it's been developed so far will help us learn for planning for the future and in shaping how the city is going to come to be. I think this discussion matters in Toronto right now because we're on the cusp and we've sort of been on the cusp for 10 years of becoming a great city. My name is Sean Martindale and I'm an interdisciplinary artist and designer. My practice is primarily focused on public space and I usually do interventions in the urban environment. So I was invited here to be part of the panel and discuss the uh, future of Toronto and, and its urban development. My name is Helena Gerdodolnik, I'm director at Workshop Architecture. We do regular architecture, a lot of community buildings and uh, urban design and that type of thing. Um, but also we really like to work with the public on um, I guess community-based projects and really my background is also as a public art consultant so kind of I come from a few different angles from architecture from public art and from urban design. My name is Mark Ryan. I'm a principal at an office called Public Work, Office for Urban Design and Landscape Architecture. We're a practice that focuses on public space design um, and with a particular interest in um, how the public realm can shape the evolution of the city. My name is Sean McAuliffe. Uh, mostly I'm a writer. Uh, I write for the Toronto Star, a weekly column about exploring Toronto um, in a whole bunch of ways, sometimes physically, sometimes mentally. I am a uh, editor and uh, co-owner of Spacing Magazine, which is a magazine about public space that's been around for a little over 10 years now. Uh, I am the moderator uh, of this discussion and it's kind of exciting to see uh, three different artists slash designers who work in public space uh, talk about why it matters. So how this will work uh, is we are going to, uh, I'm going to ask our panelists three questions um, and they have some slides prepared, uh, uh, all having to do with public space. And uh, we'll go through them. I might ask a question or two at the end. Uh, so we're gonna have three very quick rounds of that. And then uh, when it's done, we'll open it up to uh, kind of a conversation between all of us. Investing in public spaces, investing in public life, uh, the public living room of Toronto has always been somewhat controversial. Um, yet, Torontonians at the same time are also uh, obsessed with this idea of world-class city. Um, and we want to be a world-class. Are we a world-class city? Are we like New York? But then when it comes to actually paying for it, uh, it, 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 it becomes a controversial thing. Um, so hopefully what this discussion will do is, is uh, hear from some people who are coming at it from both uh, a designer uh, angle and a artistic angle about uh, not necessarily but also a bit of that about why uh, so what their work is, um, but why they're doing it and why it matters that they're doing it and why they're not uh, lawyers or something else like that. Um, so the first question we have is uh, what brings a street to life? Um, and, and in Toronto, we, uh, we, uh, we are famously an uptight city. I was walking around with somebody yesterday uh, for my Toronto Star column and uh, he was a politician and he was saying hello to everyone as we were walking and this is in Weston. Um, and I'm like, you say hi to everyone. How do you, like, uh, even if you weren't a politician, um, would you do that? And he said, well, yeah, I tried to get into saying hello to people. Uh, and, and I know Toronto is, as he said it, the screw face city. And you kind of like, like, why would anyone want to talk to me? Uh, and it's interesting to see it kind of uh, break away. But he was totally bringing the street to life as I walked with him. And I was kind of like walking in his shadow, uh, letting him bring it to life while I behaved like I normally do and not look anyone in the eye. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, each of our panelists, um, and the first uh, to, to answer this question is Helena Greta Dolnik. So uh, Helena, what brings a, a street to life? 
Um, I guess my um, biggest thing that brings the street to life is people. <laughs> Obviously, people, living beings, maybe dogs too. Um, but kind of how you do that, you know, why do some people go to some streets and not others? Um, I think it's really kind of trying to get people to, there's streets that people are already going to because there's stuff happening there and they know people go there. And I think people brings other people. Um, but to get that started in areas that don't have that, um, and these are the two examples I've got here, um, are really kind of event-based, you know, temporary public art project on the one hand that I was involved with um, called Frontier Space in Vancouver, um, where we, you know, animated this um, alley that had otherwise not really uh, been used by people other than parking and garbage and things like that. Um, and so that kind of got people there and it got people thinking about it um, and, and thinking about how we could use those spaces. But it also got all these different parties. Like, you know, it looks like really easy. You got some balloons up and a DJ and people are there. But actually, you had to work with all these the different departments in a city. You had to work with um, different building owners. Um, we worked with the nonprofit hotel society that was on this alley and all these different things. And so that kind of starts to make the street vibrant because it's not just the one event, but it's like what happens later. Um, and similarly, and it's up, this Red Blankets is a project, um, it was our warming hut, um, winning warming hut for the Winnipeg des design competition that happens every year at the Forks. And every year they have this annual event of, of these kind of art and architecture and design, and it brings people in the coldest time of the year in Winnipeg um, out in droves, and people look forward to February in Winnipeg because of it and come to this place. And so I think kind of these, um, these reasons for people to come out, um, and then they return there all year round um, as well. So I think uh, people, people make streets vibrant, but you have to work hard to get that to happen, get people there. Um, in, when you go to European cities or, or other really demonstrative cultures, people kind of just go out in the street on their own. Um, and here we kind of have to like kind of kick their ass to get them out in the street and like for, like make a, a big thing like a uh, nuit blanche or, or, or a new public space to get them out. Um, what? Like why you've been working in this and you've been like trying and, and you watch? I think I imagine quite closely the kind of people that come out and their experience. Why do you think it, why is it, is, is it so hard for us to just naturally come out uh, and we got we to gotta nudge people out? Yeah, well I think they've got hundreds of years ahead of us <laughs> in terms of people, like I think people go out to places that they've seen people go out to before, like and it's kind of that like, you know, if a street is empty, are you gonna go out to it? No, but because there's a culture of going out that like people do kind of bring people and you see that happen like sometimes even, uh, there's that William H. White documentary from the 70s or something that said like, you think that if someone stands at a corner, uh, or you think when people stop, they're gonna stop at a like less busy place, but no, and they stop to talk at the busiest place and everyone has to walk around them and bump into them. And it's somehow we like that, you know, crowdedness um, to a certain extent until it gets overly crowded like a you know, streetcar or subway. <laughs> um, but you know, we like kind of, we're attracted to people and that buzz and I think that makes people come out. But I think if we still have pretty young cities here and I think we just don't have yet the culture. And there's some places that people do often go out if you know, there's streets in the city, you see more of that and then other streets um, you know, that, that's not happening as much. And I think that it just needs to build that culture over time. Um, so we have to kind of kickstart it by these kind of things maybe. Yeah, yeah. I think that talk is uh, the social life of small urban spaces, yeah. uh, and and it's funny. Like it's funny to watch as a Torontonian because uh, it's about New York and it's about the Seagram Square, uh, and they just do it so naturally. And like all the th all, all that crowding that people do, I, I just imagine people complaining in Toronto mm -hmm. about about the crowding as we get used to, yeah. you know, being a big city. Yeah. Um, I think there's a little bit of Toronto in it too. He shows like a clip of. Nathan Phillips Square as this look, another concrete square, something like that. Uh, cool, thanks, Lena. Uh, so our next uh, presenter uh, is, or, or speaker, is Sean Martindale. So uh, what brings a street to life for you, Sean? Uh, well, I completely agree about the people is, is uh, one of the most important things, uh, well, maybe the most important thing, um, and uh, that other people will bring uh, crowds uh, or people are attracted to crowds. I, I selected uh, this project, uh, Poster Pocket Plants, which is one that I, I started in uh, 2009 with my friend Eric Chung. And, and what we do with this is uh, we go around the city and cut into uh, illegal poster ads that you find uh, on hoardings or on, on posts and uh, cut into them, fold them over, and turn them into, into planters. Uh, so just add soil and, uh, and plants and 
create these unexpected green spaces. Uh, and the reason I chose that image is uh, literally bringing uh, more life to a street in the form of you know green life, uh, plant life. Uh, I think that's actually something that also encourages people to get out into a space. Uh, park spaces are, of course, one of our most popular areas to to spend time in, um, and really important. It's not uh, necessary to to make uh, a street. Um, active to, to have plant life. I mean, you see a lot of uh, busy commercial streets, uh, areas that don't have it, and it's just the, the, the bustle of, of activity from, from commerce or from events. Uh, but I think, uh, f for, for me personally, I, li I like to see some, some uh, more biodiversity around me and, and healthy uh, green spaces. Uh, the other reason I chose that is that uh, we shouldn't be looking for a uh, homogenous solution. Like, there's no silver bullet, and uh, having a diversity of voices and having people actually engaging with the spaces around them, feeling that they have some kind of ownership of the public space, and not just uh, a user of it, not just somebody passing through and without being able to interact with it um, or interact with other people in those spaces, is uh, really important. I think and. So doing projects like this where it's, you know, something unexpected and a surprise for people, but also maybe something that a uh, passerby might recognize as being done unofficially, uh, I hope triggers people to think that, oh, maybe that's something that others can do as well, that they could do themselves or, or they could take part in some different way. Um, when you're working in public space, do you give a thought to, like, the aesthetic? Of it, obviously you do, but and you work in a, a, a particular kind of it, and and this here is like kind of collage towards gorilla, uh, but a lot of people uh, will will react to such things as just being like ugly. Why would you put this mess on the street? Um, and 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 what's what's your either either uh, response as an artist or just response as a person that kind of cares about you know the life? Yeah, no, I, I do. Um concern myself with the aesthetics uh, of, of what I do. Uh, I mean, much of what I do is uh, talking about something that's political and, and it has um, a particular issue that I'm trying to address, but I think that uh, having something that people are interested in actually looking at or appreciate uh, aesthetically is very important as well. It, it draws them into the conversation, draws them into looking at it and spending more time with it. Uh, humor as well, I mean, is another good way of uh, getting people involved in the conversation where otherwise they might not uh, take a second look. Um, with the, I mean, fortunately with plants, it's something that people seem to be very uh, hungry for. You know, whenever I've been doing these pucks for pocket plants, um, people are always stopping and, and chatting with us and thanking us for doing it and, and seem to be really drawn to it. Uh, you know, there's been cases where I was doing installation and tourists walking by joined in and, and we taught them how to do it. Um, at first, it was a project where I would do it at, at early morning, like on a, on a Sunday when nobody was really out on the streets, just uh, in, in case, you know, there was anybody that might uh, try to um, report us or, or, or get angry with what we were doing. Um, but we found that people were so interested in it that uh, I actually now don't worry about that, and, and it's it's nice to have that that direct interaction with people that are curious about it, and I can have those conversations directly about about what um, why I'm doing it. Have uh, Have you dealt with much uh, vandalism? I know there's that that public space, the the, the closed Gould Street in Ryerson, which mm. is now pedestrianized. They have those big planters mm -hmm. um, and kind of traditional big big things, uh, and they're forever being tipped over, uh, and, and, and then st the, how these plants survive, I don't know. Um, do, do people mess around with your stuff, or do they take care of it? Um, it's a mix, actually. So some people do take care, uh, in, in the case of this project, people have volunteered to water and have watered them, uh, looked in on the plants. I, I do that myself as well, if, it, if they're up for a, an extended period and uh, it's been really dry, I'll, I'll go back around and water them. Uh, uh, in the case of the pocket plants, the poster companies, uh, or it's actually one company in particular that puts up most of them around the city, is very aggressive and territorial. Uh, so they'll come and rip them down often, and sometimes it won't last more than an hour uh, before they come around and put up a new poster. Uh, other times people take the plants uh, and take them home, I, I imagine. Um, uh, but there have been cases where, you know, on, on a wall where the large 
poster company had stopped postering because it had gone so thick and, and was actually doing damage to the wall, the pockets lasted for months and we took the plants down ourselves because the winter was coming and a uh, species we had chosen we were worried wouldn't survive over the winter. Um, it, it's a real mix of people uh, taking ownership of it and taking care of the plants and, and, uh, and taking it down. And I, I don't, ex this isn't the only work I do and I don't all exclusively use plants. Uh, so uh, it's, it's always different with every project, how, how the public reacts to it and, and what people do with it. But much of my work is uh, ephemeral. And so I'm really curious the, about the lives of these projects after I put them out there. Like once you put something out there in public, it's no longer just yours anymore. It, it belongs to everybody that's using that space. You have some responsibility for it because you put it out there, but it doesn't just belong to you anymore. It's subject to the elements, it's subject to vandals, it's subject to people who, who have stake uh, in, in that, that space. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, so our last panelist is Mark Ryan. So uh, what brings a, a public space to life for you? Um, for me, like um, my colleagues, it's people. It's sort of, um, without a doubt, it's people. Um, but I think um, that's kind of obvious. And then on the other hand, it's maybe not in inherently the way streets have been um, conceived or built. And I, I think it's a kind of fascinating time where streets are kind of being rebalanced because uh, historically they were about moving goods, moving cars, moving, moving whatever modes of transportation. And now they're coming um, as a kind of renaissance where they come back to being, um, promoting more human life and a balance of other ways of moving. So, um, I think um, the street itself is is a subject. It, it carries sort of all kinds of uh, life. I mean, utilities are a part of that. People are a part of that. Uh, the ecology of the city is part of that. Um, and all forms of transportation um, factor into that. But I think the edges are another important factor of how, um, how the life is fueled by a sort of development fronting streets. And I think that's sort of... A, Key area where um, there's a kind of ecosystem, so to speak, that yeah. that comes to life. It's the street and it's it's, it's edges and how this starts to create, um, I, yeah, in a way, friction and 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 creates creates life. And I, I love this image. I, I don't know what it means exactly, but this this old Toronto muddy York image because it's sort of like such an amazing reminder of where that we started in the city with streets and. Um, Something that's sort of beautiful about it is sort of the like, the textures of this kind of surface, and and so on, and and the kind of theater of what happens here, or what would have maybe happened here, and and and, and the way you know, like the sort of this sort of whatever, maybe a stalled car in the mud, and how that starts to generate people talking mm -hmm. and kind of um, interest in people meeting is, I think, whole part of this kind of potential of streets as um, as really true public spaces, which again isn't totally obvious, but a third of our ci of most cities is composed of streets. And um, that as a subject uh, is super interesting and within my discipline because we're rarely making brand new parks and public spaces, but more and more we have the, the opportunity to rethink streets and to sort of, let's say, create new venues for uh, public life within them. You've worked on major public projects uh, funded by cities, um, uh, voted by city councils. When you're coming to a place, how much thought do you give to the culture, the political culture of a place, um, or the current city council? Do you pay attention to those things? Uh, and, and this conversation is definitely couched in Toronto, where, where, where these kind of public expenditures and, and a city's natural uh, kind of giving into the acceptance of these things um, is always a bit in play. Right. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, I mean, working in the public realm or working um, in these types of public projects is always political to a large degree. Um, I think the, the work that the water, what Waterfront Toronto has been doing on the waterfront is a really interesting illustration of how um, those things are dealt with and also somehow Overcome. I mean, the fact that Queen's Key is now under construction or really well th through construction is going to be opened um, next year is, is a huge achievement. And I mean, one of the really exciting or like strategic moments in that history was um, creating a, a 
installation of Key to the City, which was a 10-day closure of the street where we showcased the, the ideas of the, of the competition, where we closed down the road, reshuffled the traffic, and really illustrated how it could work um, as a kind of one-to-one -one model. And that, you know, the mayor was there. This was former mayor, of course. But um, people saw how this was possible and, and realized that, you know, you, ca you can change a street, even if temporarily it shows how it can happen in the future. Plus, New York's a perfect example. I mean, unfortunately, in the, all we have to do is look to, to New York and how they've 180 degree turn on their streets in the last six years, um, where they used to be you know, all about cars moving and now they're really all about people. Um, so mayors, I think, can also benefit from other city mayors and, and seeing how the examples are, um, like, yeah, can work and are possible and sort of open Open, open, a, open an attitude, a new attitude. That's a good segue to our next question, um, which is how to design, plan, and build uh, public spaces. Um, and, and thinking in particular uh, where you've worked uh, uh, and, and, and the city that you guys live in uh, and work in, uh, the, the waterfront, which has been this focus of Torontonians for so long. Um, and, and, and I think there's this like deep, deep, cynicism about the waterfront and, and nothing will ever happen. Even though there's things there now and you did the 10-day the festival of what's going to happen, you still see the kind of re uh, reverting to this idea that people have because it's been 30 years of, of talking about it. It's kind of, it's kind of like the, the high-speed rail of, of, of our waterfront, like this thing we talk about that will never happen. Rail, maybe, but, but the waterfront is actually happening. Um, so how do, you, how do you design for, for uh, a public space that, that, that people perhaps don't even uh, think will ever happen. And there's like, how do, how do you get over the kind of natural cynicism yeah. of those things? And I think, um, you know, in terms of how do you plan and design a public space, there's two main approaches we see. And it's like, one is that top down of like, you know, we've got a decision. Um, we are maybe still going to go out for feedback and like we're going to ram this down people's throats. It's like, you know, the city's already decided what they're going to do or whoever's decided what's going to happen. But then there's the bottom up and it's like, oh, we'll ask people. It's like, you know, what do you want in your park or what do you want for the public space? But I think both of those don't get you the result that you want and you need something of both. And I think, you know, people who, you know, people are well-traveled in Toronto, but they might not kind of have the language of what do we want, what can we expect? They kind of think like I'm saying this in parameters of what I'm used to in Toronto and what we do. So park means, you know, some grass and trees and some benches and, you know, I can't expect much more. Um, and, but, you know, the top-down approach isn't right because, you know, it doesn't take into consideration the fact that local people actually know a lot about um, what they need in the area, what, what's important, um, some of the kind of minutia of stuff that you might not even realize is really important, um, you know, that you could remove and you, you know, take away this kind of life because you're not there all the time and they are. So kind of for me, the best way to plan and build and, and kind of the, the work that I've been doing um, in different types of projects for a while is top down, bottom up at the same time, um, which um, is the green line that, that I have the picture of here is kind of an example of that, which is um, there's this idea that um, my firm had um, where we thought, you know, there's, we're, we're both working and living um, really close to this hydro corridor that we use as shortcuts, and there's a lot of parks along there, um, and it's in midtown Toronto. And uh, we just thought, like, you know, this would make a great five kilometer long linear park. Um, but that's kind of this top down, you know, I've got an idea, I'm a designer, you know, let's just make it. You know, obviously that's not going to happen. Um, never mind the fact that we don't own <laughs> the land and, you know, there's a lot of permissions involved. But what we decided to do is open it up to an international competition to get a bunch of ideas, none of which will be built. And we got, you know, you can see the picture here is people seeing all those ideas and just getting the conversation started. So that top down is not about designing the project, but it's getting that conversation started so you can get more meaningful feedback over time. And also what's interesting is to do that before the city already has a budget for a park. Like, you know, once once you have um, a public space and there's a budget attached and everything, there's a timeline and that money's got to get spent in the next two years. You have no time at that point for that kind of meaningful discussion. So, you know, my, my end of things um, and, and the work that I had done um, both um, in England before, uh, but, but now in, in Toronto, um, is to try, and in Vancouver uh, before that, but is to try to kind of get people excited about spaces before 
they're actually a project and maybe trying to make it into a project and, and, and to have that um, kind of inspiration and momentum um, build up, but then really then getting, you know, over, over time that meaningful feedback from people um, to make spaces that we want, not just spaces that a designer has conceived um, on, on paper. Um, having paid attention to the Green Line over the last few years, um, and the Green Line is between Davenport and DuPont, uh, it's kind of like a waterfront analog almost, because it's linear, uh, it's just uh, 10, 20, 15 blocks north. Mm. Um, but the reaction to the Green Line seemed overwhelmingly positive, like people got excited about it. Do you think it had anything to do with that, like the, the space, the hydro corridor, uh, kind of post semi-industrial, whatever, uh, had, no, had no baggage, whereas like mm -hmm. the waterfront has history and people have all these expectations and all our eyes have been on it forever. Yeah. Um, and yet no one, no, one, no one ever you know, talked about the Green Line until you did, and then yeah. it just seemed happy. Well, I think there's a lot of interest, and you know, there's a lot of examples of other projects. The Highline always comes up as a, you know using infrastructure and and using them as as linear parks or public spaces. But I think there's a lot of interest in kind of this this type of kind of um, you know the I guess. 19th and 20th century um, infrastructure relics kind of getting reused as public space. And I think that's an interest that a lot of people have, even if they don't kind of know it firsthand, um, you know, and people who don't know anything about urban design visit New York and then go down the Highland, they go, wow, this is great. We need one on the Gardener. And when you kind of think the Gardener, that, that doesn't make any sense on the Gardener. But um, I think that there's, there is that interest in these kind of cool little projects that you might like share on, you know, Facebook or whatever that, that people have. And the, the waterfront is kind of too big for people to kind of feel like they can kind of picture what that's going to look like and how that can change. Um, and I think this is something maybe at a scale where people can wrap their heads around what that could look like. And, you know, although we had a lot of different examples of what, you know, designers had, uh, what, what it could look like, I think everyone in their head when they talk about it, I think that's one of the reasons why it's so successful and we've got a lot of interest is everyone says the green line and they picture in their head what their green line is going to look like. Um, and, and we're not at the point yet where there's a fixed um, you know, design and it's going to be this or this. And I think that's kind of one of the reasons why it's exciting, um, that it's still pretty open. Um, you know, and, and we have now a lot of momentum. We're working with parks, park people, um, have a Friends of the Green Line um, group that have 30, 350 people on it now. So if anyone isn't on it, um, you can go to um, uh, Green Line on Facebook. But it's greenlinetoronto.ca. is not an active site right now. But uh, you can find it through Park People's website. But, uh, you know, it's just this, this um, you know, it's been growing and people really want to kind of be part of it, I think, because they feel like they might be able to decide what's happening. The waterfront feels like, you know, even as a designer or whatever, you feel like it's too big for me to feel like I can make any difference on what might happen there, maybe. Um, you know, not to say that it isn't and, and that there's great things that are happening, but I think that might be why this was kind of a, a more medium scale project. Like neighborhood scale, yeah. almost. Yeah. Sean? Um, yeah. Well, actually, uh, again, I echo a lot of <laughs> my colleagues here. Um, a lot of uh, my work is also trying to get people interested in a public space before there's actually an official project happening with it. And so the ideas that I, I put out there are, I consider them just possibilities. They, you know, I'm not trying to say this is the way things have to be or should be, but uh, this is an alternative and, and, and we can maybe uh, look at this differently. You can, you can take things from this or, or reject it entirely, but at least it's, it's getting people to focus on uh, these spaces and issues and materials that are around our public spaces. Um, the, the image I chose here is from a project I did called Outside the Planner Boxes, where I noticed uh, a lot of our city's tree planters were falling apart, have big cracks in them, chunks missing. Um, in the case of this one, uh, they had tried to replace a broken planter um, along University Avenue uh, with this new two-piece one, but it didn't fit around the mature tree trunk. Um, and so it just had this big gap that was left, and I, I kept an eye on it, and you know, it, through the winter there was snow on it, and all the, the roots uh, exposed there. So uh, I had this idea to make it look like grass was spilling out like liquid from, from that gap. And, um, I, I did a series of interventions and invited other artists, designers, gardeners, and people interested in, in these issues to also create their own interventions around these broken planters or, or um, unfit, unfitting planters around the city. And 
I, I, I was really uh, happy to see how, how much people actually were engaging with the project. You know, uh, there was somebody who came across one of um, my friends who was installing their piece and asked what was going on. And the very next day, they went out and did two of their own, um, which we included in the overall project once I, once I tracked them down. But the whole point of, of these things for me is, yeah, to get the conversation going and present possibilities. And so maybe it is something that we want to see more permanently, but it doesn't have to be that as, as long as it's getting people to consider it more. Um, the reason I chose this is that uh, like the High Line in New York and, and all these old industrial uh, sites, I think that we also always have to consider that change is inevitable. So we're not going to design a utopia that's going to stay the same way all the time. It's, it's going to eventually change, and we need to design for that, for a diversity of voices, for uh, open futures. And you don't have to design things to be permanent. You, you can design uh, for things to be ephemeral. Uh, or to be adaptable over time so that the, the, it can be a multi-use space that doesn't only serve one function um, and, and people could use it for different purposes over time. Um, there, there's also, I think, uh, a problem with, with certain structures, you know, like we have all these condos that are, are falling apart before people even start living in them. So in some cases, you do want to design things more strongly and have them maintained. Um, and it, the trick is knowing when to do that and, and when to allow something to be uh, more uh, adaptable over time and, and uh, when a more ephemeral and temporary approach is, is desired. Um, and I think on the street level, uh, that's where we want that the most. You know, it, it, we want our spaces to, to be open for conversation and to have a plurality of voices, whether those voices are in agreement or, or in uh, disagreement. I mean, one of the theorists I like to look at a lot is, is Chantal Mouffe, and she has this idea of uh, an agonistic democracy or pluralism. And the idea is that we shouldn't uh, look at people with opposite views as our enemy in an antagonistic way, but as somebody to uh, to debate against, like to have that conversation with. And you're not necessarily going to be swayed at the end of the day by their thinking, but at least it gets you to rethink your own thinking and, and there is opportunity for it not just to be a one-sided conversation. And that's healthy. That's a healthy democracy. That's a healthy public space where it's not everybody just thinking this is the way things have to be. Our, our practice has very much been focused about how um, places can engage really deeply in uh, the context of a place, but also how people can engage with that context. So it's almost to think of um, design as a way to invite people into occupying spaces in new ways and effectively they could allow them to see their familiar surroundings in another in another way in a new way perhaps um, uh, and so I, I mean we're also in the end designing real physical places with materials that you exist in so um, I, I feel very strongly that um, uh, kind of memorable places can uh, are somehow um, need to have a strong idea that is a spatial idea about how you um, you exist in a space and how that feels and how how um, the dimensions and the physical environment is, is formed and um, and to be driven by a strong spatial idea for for what that could mean to um, to a visitor and what what the possibilities could be in a space so um, um, I'm very also interested in how that can be a conversation that's very open and inclusive, but how it's not just about sort of like what, what would you like to see in the park? Would you like a barbecue or a pit or a picnic table? But also, can you actually bring people into a conversation about um, defining space and what that means and what that feels like and really bringing them into a conversation that often is just a bit in, internal to the designers or, or, or professionals, but really just so that the, the conversation... Um, it's really about the making of, of places and what that really means, not just about programs. Do you, do you think of, a, as a designer, uh, like the weight of, of that responsibility? Like you, you are, you're designing someone's public living room, a whole bunch of people, uh, and you're almost like physically moving them around. Like you will move here, you will walk along this path. Um, just like, like well, how heavy is that? <laughs> no, but, well, that's pretty heavy, but I think we, like the, there's an effort to 
keep it much more uh, flexible. I mean, you spoke to a lot of that. How can you de design for its ev an evolution of a place and really the the things you might not even expect to happen in a place? But uh, um, I, you know, I I think there's there are, there are predictable patterns, social patterns, or human behavioral patterns, and there's also those that are kind of beyond your anticipation. I mean, the wave decks, which is at the top here, are an example of how. Um, the forms of the, the, the structure and the curvature was, was designed really specifically to you know, focus certain kinds of, of environments, spaces, views, and to allow people to occupy it in different ways. But we didn't entirely know how that, you know, that the sliding might occur on those timbers in that particular spot. You know? like, and so there's wonderful surprises that when you keep those unexpected in mind um, as a designer, um, wonderful things can happen. Thanks. So we have one more question, and, and this one is kind of contentious, topical in Toronto, uh, the balance between public and private interests. Uh, in public space, Toronto has had some kind of high profile things from Dundas Square when it opened. Uh, public Square, uh, publicly owned but privately run, uh, and there were uh, issues at the beginning of 2002 or three, whenever it opened with uh, protesters being shuffled off by zealous security, um, which I think has lightened it up. I've seen some really great moments like Idle No More there two winters ago um, and, and things like that. Uh, but like of late, a few weeks ago, maybe in July or June, uh, at the corner of Young and Bloor, there, uh, there was there was in front of like the the Royal Bank Bay Building. The woman locked up her bike, and she found out that the uh, it was gone. And and Brookfield Security, who owns the building, uh, who ironically were the people that own the square uh, where um, where the what's the one percent thing called? Um, Occupy, sorry. Uh, Occupy started in, on Wall Street, uh, Brookfield. So a weird connection about public space occupation. Uh, but here it's Brookfield ripping off uh, bicycles locked to a public TTC post um, and, and, and the Twitter storm and media storm that followed uh, was a really interesting uh, affirmation of public space. The amount of offense that people took to Brookfield not liking bicycles on their aesthetically perfect uh, Yorkville uh, granite black sidewalks uh, was kind of this great like moment of when, when, when it's like, we need these reminders sometimes in Toronto, especially during this election year, uh, of what matters. Um, so just really quickly, uh, thoughts on, on balancing um, those two things. Yeah. And I think, you know, often we think of those as antagonistic, and I'd like to say that th there's a lot of times when private um, and public uh, interests are the same. Um, and that we have to remember that. And I think, you know, this example I have, the top photo is Hoxton Square in London. And, you know, why are all those people standing around? It's because, one, um, the relaxation of some laws, which means that you can take your beer out from all the different restaurants and bars around there and walk out into the street with them. So that's one way also to make a street vibrant, um, allow public drinking. Um, but also there's a lot of, you know, the White Cube uh, Gallery and there's other galleries around. And people are, like, you know, there are, pri those are it's a private gallery, but you know that interest is the same, and it makes a great urban space. And I, um, my office uh, is a storefront office, and right next door to us we have a barber shop, and a couple doors down we have um, a laundromat, and then we have a, Pol uh, a Portuguese bakery. And the liveliness that that brings to the street, and that's pr public, you know, that's that's private um, businesses, um, but public interest and people both need to use those services but also want that and I think kind of if we start to allow a little bit more happening in that kind of street facing um, and relax in the laws or, or that um, you know there's a lot of parks I know in Canada we really like to not allow any private businesses going into parks to do anything but you see that you know you brought up kind of European examples you see a lot more kind of either ice cream carts or um, you know a cafe in a city uh, or in a park being run by a private business or something like that um, very successfully and it brings kind of those spaces to life and so I think kind of we should not worry about that too much. Um, and the bottom example is White Cross Street, which is not a great image, it's just a Google image. But um, what's great about that is that the whole street got redesigned around kind of what was already happening, what the businesses needed and things. It's a market street and it doesn't look, 
it doesn't look that impressive because um, what happens is there's the, the markets um, would have generators going on, the, all the market stalls had generators and they're needing to somehow bring potable water. But that all happens now underneath the street with a little kind of key lock mechanism. So it's, you know, it's this private interest of, you know, needing some of these things to sell their product. But, you know, it's just unlocked in the middle of this public space. And that when the street got redesigned, the sidewalk on the sunny side um, was, is wider than the other side because it's actually the one that, that you want to more be in. And kind of, in Toronto, we try to be too equal even with private interests on a street. So it's like the idea of having one sidewalk on the, like, the south side of the street being you know, a different width than the north side of the street would be like just you know, so difficult to do here. When you just kind of, you know, Nature is doing it already, and in this photo is a good example. It's like, you know, it's not equal. Um, businesses, you know, more restaurants open on, on the, the south-facing side than the north-facing side. Um, you know, it's just something that we have to kind of maybe be aware of, of that as well, not try to be too equal with private interests, but also sometimes realize that private interests are, for, are, are fine. It's not a, you know, private isn't a dirty word. Uh, you can even answer this yes or no, because uh, you've, you've worked in various yeah. municipalities that are not Toronto yeah. and European ones, uh, and we've just had some excruciating things here, failed things with the food carts yeah. uh, and then the, the, the food trucks. Yeah. Um, do you think, do, are you positive about Toronto's ability to kind of come around to some things like this or not? Well, I think if we changed kind of some of the attitudes in public health to be more like, yes, let's, let's try to find a way to say yeah, let, or like having public health be able to say yes a bit more often. If you've ever gotten a permit to serve food in a park, which I have gotten, you know, it's to the point of, you know, ridiculousness, um, you know, just trying to cook hot dogs and serve it to people, like there's a lot of hoops to jump through and, and there isn't a culture of yes. And I think if we could change that, and that, that's just a change of, you know, who's, on, who's managing that department and, and even council kind of directing that. You know, I think there's a lot of cities around, even in the GTA, that are, are more of a culture of yes for things like food trucks and, and that type of thing. And I think there is a, a definitely a culture of no in that. Yeah, thanks. Sean? Um, so actually on this one, I, do, I guess I'd only partially agree with you. Uh, I mean, I do think uh, we do need a lot more culture of yes in, in Toronto in many ways. And, and there are certainly um, areas of overlapping private public interest. Um, however, I feel like uh, there is far too much privatization of, of, of public space and, and commercial in commercial interests specifically. Um, this this image I chose is uh, one from a project I did in St. John's, uh, Newfoundland, uh, a temporary project. But at, at the time, they were just installing this fence along their historic harbor front. And this fence, which was largely paid for uh, from tax money, actually cut off the public from its own harbor front, which they've been able to access since the fund founding of, of, of the city. Um, and it was really to serve the purposes of uh, oil companies that were used setting up there and, uh, and uh, cruise liners. Um, but if you look at other cities uh, and how they han handled that, there really wasn't a need to uh, block off so much of the harbor front from the public. You could, you could just block off certain sections, which actually they had already done in St. John's. Um, but uh, generally, I, and this isn't an issue specific to Toronto at all, uh, I think there, it's far too much of this commercial influence in our public spaces, uh, especially around things like p public advertising. That's an issue that's very close to my heart. Uh, we have... Uh, I think far too much of it globally. Uh, this this project actually was part of uh, ad takeover that I, I took part in uh, two years ago now. I think it was uh, where we uh, put artwork inside the the information pillars that you see around the city. And these information pillars are essentially billboards masquerading as uh, helpful things for people walking by, but. If you look at them, the design, the front face where I have that Sidewalk 54 graphic is where the ad goes, and on the other side there's another ad, and then on the pole holding it up is where you find information. And when they first installed them, the only information was call 311 or 411 uh, without any other, no maps, no nothing. Now they've got some maps on them, but it's still taking up far too much of our public space for private interests. Uh, here I was just uh, kind of satirizing that and playing it up and actually privatizing more of the sidewalk and turning it into a club where people have to line up 
and get into it. So we had this this uh, extra private uh, luxury space on the sidewalk, and and it actually turned into a, a dance party that night where people would come in and dance in that little section, and but they'd have to line up first to get in. Um, but uh, that's that's an issue. Part of it was, uh, I mean, around the public advertising part of the issue of why we have so much of it and, and why there's actually a lot of illegal uh, public advertising around our city is uh, because of the amalgamation of, of Toronto. Uh, we had all these different areas with different laws and rules. And so when, when we amalgamated, uh, there wasn't a clear guideline as and laws for people to enforce. And even now that there is, the enforcement is still is still lacking. Um, so that, and I mean, and spaces like uh, the square at Young and Dundas there, I, th I think um, it's, it's a shame that we're, we're, we're giving so much of our public space over to commercial interests. Yeah, I mean, these two, I've, I just was intrigued by these two as very um, different interpretations of sort of the line of where public and private start and finish. And in some ways, you know, for me, the, um, part of um, or one of the tasks we're often dealing with is how to articulate that those edges or those boundaries and, and what they what shape they they take. I mean, on the left, this is sort of like you could argue is sort of like well, we, we know what it is. It's it's all suburbia, but where it originated was an idea for how the private realm could actually really give something back in the form that everyone's individual private front yards would sort of um, create this pastoral shared park-like setting. So in some, some ways, it comes from a very positive instinct. And yet, it produces a sort of format that we now come to understand as very unsustainable and also doesn't really support the kind of public life or energy that we think of as positive. And then on the other hand, yeah. And then on the other hand, sort of, this, could, this happens to be in Rome, but it could be in many European or medieval cities where there's this kind of collision of a very, very reduced public realm, or you could say a small compressed public realm where p private realm comes right to its edges and yet there's an incredible um, kind of texture detail and um, visual interest where the a quality is created out of that sort of private edge and um, sort of to find a positive in, in amidst of course of, so we can there's a number of uh, sort of uh, disturbing political dimensions to all this conversation, but on the other hand, let's say, with the tools that we have as, in, in, as designers, I'm interested in what are the new ways where we can begin to find, to, to Helena's point, some of the, the common, let's say, synergies or, or to, yeah, to find um, ways that that interface can um, bring compatibilities and also, let's say, um, common benefits to both realms, the public and the private realms. That's a, there's no answer there, but of course that's like, I would say, one of the big tasks. Let's say, how can that artic articulation bring quality that um, it truly is a quality? Because if you sat on someone's private stoop on that Roman street, it'd be cool, you know, and if someone came out, they'd get out of the way, but on this side, the cops would be called, you yeah. know, if you were sitting on their stoop. Right, so. and so there was, matter. yeah, we can't go and play frisbee on that, in that park. Yeah, right, because it isn't one. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. So, uh, just on that thing about stoops, actually, so in the um, revitalization of uh, the Regent Park, uh, a lot of the youths from the neighborhood who came back after the revitalization to still live there uh, tried to hang out on their own stoops like they used to of these buildings, but all the new tenants who weren't used to having these young uh, kids are hanging out were threatened by that and started calling the police on them and uh, so the youth no longer really spend time in their own neighborhood and, and go elsewhere uh, so the, the loss of of, uh, of that shared public culture that they had before um, because of, of um, I guess misunderstandings within this new community that was uh, formed very quickly from a discussion like this, I think the things people can take away are some new ideas, because you're seeing people who work in public space uh, talk about stuff that really kind of invigorates them. But I hope people come away with uh, the value of it. Um, often people put a, a dollar amount on public spaces, like this was too much money, why did we spend so much money on this? And the value is ephemeral. It's about the life that we live, and it's, it's really long term. And we tend to run in very short, political cycles and everything else, and personal cycles, uh, so we don't think of things in the long term. Um, so I hope people come away with 
some reaffirmed or perhaps additional uh, value for public space? Uh, it's hopefully something people can take and start to think more about the many dimensions of designing the public realm. I hope that there'll be uh, some more focus on these ideas and uh, just more civic engagement around uh, the future of our city and, and the current state of our city. I mean, that's something I try to do in my work in general, is just try to open up the conversation and have people maybe re-examine how they're uh, approaching uh, life in the city and, and how they, they pass through spaces and use spaces and how those areas might be different or how they're working well already. I think that there are a lot of different ways to look at how we build a city. There is a discussion to be had, um, that it isn't just that we have to do everything the way we've done it before, um, that there are ways to think about it a little bit differently.